Great, we're getting ready to start unit three. And unit three is over exponential functions and logarithmic functions. So this first lesson is our lesson on exponential functions. And so I wanna start off by just like um, doing a table of values and finding the graph of two exponential functions. So for the first one, we are going to uh, graph the function f of x equals two to the x. So I'm just gonna start at the bottom of the table of values. Um, and plug in 3 for x. So 2 to the third is 8. 2 to the second is 4. 2 to the first is 2. 2 to the zero is 1. All right, then let's start thinking about what negative exponent means. So if we were continuing that pattern as we go up, we're basically dividing by um, 2. And so if I divide by 2 again, I'm going to get one half. And again, I'm going to get one fourth. And then I'm going to get one eighth. And so a negative exponent doesn't ever make something negative. What it does is the reciprocal, right? So if I go to graph those, um, I'll just graph these ordered pairs. It's really hard to graph one eighth. <laughs> it's really close to zero. That is what exponential function looks like. It's, so it's, it's larger and larger and larger. And it does keep going in both directions. All right. So if I was going to give the domain of this function, because I have an arrow pointing to the left and an arrow pointing to the right, it would be all real numbers. All right, so um, you can have any real number be an exponent. But then for the range, this function levels off and there's never a number you can raise two to to make it zero or negative. So our range is going to be from zero to infinity, but it does not include zero. Or if you would rather, you can write that as y is greater than zero. And this graph, is going to have a horizontal asymptote. And it is going to be at y equals zero. All right, so let's look at this other one. Um, this one is two to the negative x. So if I put in negative three, negative negative three is positive three, and that's gonna be eight. All right, and then two to the negative negative two, or two to the positive two, one, two to the first, there is no negative zero, so two to the zero is still one. Right, then I put in one is two to the negative one, which we already know. No, 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 just kidding. Which we already know is one half. All right, and then two to the negative two is one fourth, and two to the negative three is one eighth. All right, so then when I graph these, I still get an exponential function. But this time, the values are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. They're never going to get to zero. They just approach it. Let me try that again. All right. And then and if I go to find the domain, um, we have arrows pointing left and right. So that's going to be all real numbers. The range is everything above zero, and then the horizontal asymptote is the same also. So both of these graphs have those characteristics. This one on the left is called exponential growth, and the one on the right is exponential decay. So you have exponential growth when the base is greater than one, And the exponent is positive. Okay. Now, the other situation is when the base is between zero and one, and the exponent is negative. Right? And then we're going to have exponential decay in this situation like what we have above where the base is greater than one and 
exponent we had was a 2, and the exponent is negative. Or we could write that a different way. This 2 to the negative x could also be written as 1 half to the positive x. So that's the other situation when you can have decay, is when the base is between 0 and 1, and the exponent is positive. All right. In all exponential functions, have a horizontal asymptote. And it's going to be associated with the vertical shift. All right. So the vertical shift would not be added or subtracted in the exponent. That's not going to be the vertical shift. The vertical shift is going to be what's added or subtracted on the, on the level, the um, basic level of the function. All right. So let's look at example one. We're going to identify the function as growth or decay, and then we are also going to um, identify the horizontal asymptote. All right, so this um, first one, we have f of x equals e to the x minus 1 plus 3. So we have to determine if our base is greater than 1 or between 0 and 1. Now in this case, E is the base. It's approximately 2.71828 and a whole bunch of other numbers. So that's definitely greater than 1. All right. And then we're determining if the exponent is positive or negative. We're really looking at just the x part, not the minus 1, just the x part. And that is um, positive. So this is going to be growth. All right. And then the horizontal asymptote is associated with the vertical shift. So it's going to be y equals 3. Okay. So let's look at b. Our base is 1.5, so that's greater than 1. And then our exponent is negative. So when you have that situation, the base is greater than 1, the exponent is negative, this is going to be exponential decay. And then we're going to look here for the horizontal asymptote. So it's going to be y equals negative 2. All right, let's look at c. So we're looking at the base. The base is between 0 and 1. 2 thirds is between 0 and 1. And then we're looking at the exponent. The x part of the exponent is positive. So between 0 and 1, positive exponent is going to be exponential decay. All right. And then our horizontal asymptote, um, there's nothing added at the end. There's just something added to the exponent that doesn't change the horizontal asymptote. There's nothing added at the end, so it's going to be y plus zero is your horizontal asymptote. All right, you guys pause the video and try to do E, uh, D on your own, please. All right, so our base is between 0 and 1. Our exponent is negative, so that is going to be exponential growth. All right, and then looking at the horizontal asymptote, we have this plus 1 out here. That's going to make y plus 1 the horizontal asymptote. Okay, so let's look at some common exponential models. Um, a couple of these you guys did talk about in um, Algebra 2, um, but not all of them. So before we do this, let's talk about what a lot of variables stand for. So we're going to use P in, a, in all of these. And P is going to be the initial deposit or the initial amount. All right. T is, we're going to use that in all of these, and it needs to be time in years. All 
right? We're going to use n in one of these, and n is always going to be the number of times per year compounded, and we'll know what that is in just a second. All right, R is going to be the interest rate as a decimal. All right, and this last problem is going to use K, and K is going to be the half-life. Okay, so here we go. So compound interest, this is when the interest is compounded so many times per year. So um, it's going to be A equals P, and then in parentheses, 1 plus R over N raised to the NT. All right, and then like we were just saying, um, P is the initial amount, T is time in years, N is the number of times per year it's compounded, and R is the interest rate as a decimal. All right, continuously compounded interest is the easiest one. Um, your Algebra 2 teacher has probably taught you A pert, but it's A equals E. E is the exponential base. Um, that number we just talked about, the 2.71828, raised to the RT. And then half-life formula is not one, I don't, I don't think you guys did this in Algebra 2. So um, it's, we'll call it Q is equal to P, the initial amount. And it's going to be one half raised to the t divided by k. Now k is a half life, so all radioactive material decays over time, and the half life is the amount of time it takes for half of the original uh, amount to be left. Okay, and I can see a typo on this first question. <laughs> all right, so on the day of a child's birth. A deposit, that's not even a sentence, sorry, that should be a comma. A deposit of, and I have too many zeros, um, $25,000 is made in a trust fund that pays 8.25% interest. We're going to create a model to find the balance if the interest is compounded quarterly. All right, so compounded quarterly is compound interest, is compounded so many times per year. So that's the first formula. So A equals P is going to be the initial amount that's deposited, which is $25,000. All right, one is always going to be one. All right, and then R is the interest rate as a decimal. In number of times per year compounded. Quarterly means four times per year. And then T, that four goes two places, and then T is your variable. And that's all we're doing. We're just creating the model and then stopping. All right, let's look at three. You invest $12,000 at an annual rate of 3%. Write a model that would represent the balance if the interest is compounded continuously. So continuously compounded interest is the second formula. Right, R as a decimal is 0 0.03 and then T. So I just put my initial amount in, my R as a decimal, and T is the variable. All right, in, on example four, in 1986, a nuclear reactor accident occurred in Chernobyl in what was then the Soviet Union. The explosion spread highly toxic radioactive chemicals such as plutonium over hundreds of square miles. The half-life of plutonium is about 24,100 years. If the initial amount of plutonium was 10 pounds, write a model to represent the amount present after T years, T years after the accident. All right, so um, that means the 24,100 years is after that amount of time, half of the original amount of plutonium would be left. So that is my K. This is really sad. This actually happened. All right, 
So the initial amount is 10 pounds, so it's going to be 10. All right, and then this is a half-life problem, so the base is one half, and then it's T divided by 24,100 years. All right, oh, well, we can call it A or Q, it doesn't matter. All right, and then if you wanted to figure out how much of the original 10 um, pounds is left, um, it's been, wait, 30, yeah, 34 years since 1986. So we could take 34 and plug that in, and almost all of it is still remaining. That's a really long half-life. Um, so people still cannot live in that city or miles away. People have to live miles and miles away. So, and more than 10 pounds was definitely um, put out that day. So it's been 34 years since 1986. All right, so 9.990 pounds of that initial, initial amount is still hanging out. Super, super sad. All right, so for example, five, the value a truck the value of a truck originally worth $49,810 depreciates so that each year it's worth seven eighths of its value from the previous year. Um, we'll find a model, B of T, which represents the, uh, I don't know, we're changing from truck to van, so let's just say truck. <laughs> After T years. All right. So this one's different than the others, um, but we can still do it. So um, the initial value is still going to be what's right after the equal sign. And each year it's worth seven, seven eighths of its original value. And then that's raised to the T. All right. So we don't have like a, a, a formula, a model for that, but we can write our own. All right. So your summit is to do those seven questions on your own paper.